Um, the first thing to always click on is result summary. So result set number one is from load step one, sub step one. We only had one sub step in, and load step here because it was quite a simple analysis. Later on, if you have more complicated analysis and you've lots of sub steps, it's always important to have a look at, at this box to see which step you want to look at. So here by default, we're going to only be looking at the one set of results that is available to us. Uh, again, read results. It's always a good idea to say which one you want, you know, so by pick, that's the only one that's available here. So I'm just going to tell it to read that. And um, we can close that box. And then what do we want to do? Um, let's plot some results. Okay, so let's have a look at the deform shape. So we go into plot results, expand that. We go to deform shape. Um, so it's always a good idea to have a look at the deformed and the undeformed together um, just to see what the, the difference has been. So you can see here that the deform shape is shown in blue and the undeformed shape, the original shape, is shown in the dashed white there. So what's happened? Due to the loads that are applied, the um, bridge has bowed down in the middle, as you'd expect, because there was a lot of load on these two points here. Uh, there was also some load on these points, which would have been distributed along. Um, so that's that's the kind of load we'd expect, or the kind of deformation we'd expect, if um, a heavy truck was on this bridge, for example. You can also see that this point here, which wasn't fixed in the horizontal direction, has moved out, as we would expect, again, to, to take account of this bowing effect. And the left-hand side has stayed exactly where it is, because that's what we told it it had to do. We told it it was fixed in all degrees of freedom. So if we look at the uh, dimensions of the problem, and we take, for example, that the, the, this length here is, is 4 metres, this length is 2 metres, you know, it, would, it would appear that this bridge is actually um, deformed by you know, about a quarter of a metre, about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a metre here, which, you know, would be quite unexpected given that we have a linear elastic um, uh, material model. So if we look up here at the DMX, which is telling us the maximum deformation of any point in the model, it's telling us that maximum deformation is 0 0.0089 metres. So in other words, it's it's, it's about 8.9 millimetres. So clearly, this is showing a lot more than, uh, than what actually happened. So you might ask yourself, what's going on there? ANSYS automatically scales the results to make what happened a lot more obvious to you so that you can clearly see what's happening. If you want to actually remove that scaling, you go up here to Plot Controls, Style, um, and we see we have Displacement Scaling. So as you can see, it's auto-calculated here. So ANSYS has scaled up the, the displacement by 56. So it's, it's magnified it by 56 times, basically. So if I put on True Scale and go Apply and just take a look at what happened, you can see that the the actual deformation is tiny. So we're looking at, you know, eight millimeters, which is really what happened. Okay, so I'm just going to put back on the, the magnified uh, displacement scaling for the time being as it makes it clear to us what's going on. So there is our um, deformed shape. Um, that all looks okay. It all ties in with the problem. If your deformed shape that you have um, doesn't look like this, then you've done something wrong along the way. So maybe go back over the video and compare all the steps with the steps that you took and try and find uh, where you did something wrong. It's possible that you put a, an extra constraint on here or you put the load in the wrong place or something like that or even use the wrong units or wrong material properties. So so go back and, and check every step and just make sure that um, you're happy with it, with uh, what you've done and um, I'm sure you'll find that this, the problem is somewhere and you should, you should end up with this exact same result as we have here. Okay, the next thing we're asked for um, in the, the case study A in chapter 10 of the book is to determine the stress in each member of the, the truss framework. So normally we would go straight to a contour plot here in ANSYS, a nodal solution, pick stress and pick whichever component of stress we were interested in. Let's just pick, for argument's sake, von Mises stress here, which is an, an average stress. Um, but it's not giving us what we want here. We're not getting different values of stress in in, e in each um, element. Okay, so if you have used um, uh, some of the more complicated elements in ANSYS before, you, you would have gotten your stress results uh, in this manner. So it can be quite confusing. Um, the thing is with these um, uh, truss elements, um, you have to actually um, go about getting the stress results in a different way. You have to create an element table. Um, so let's, let, let's see how we can work that out. Let's take a look at the help um, for this particular element. So let's go up to the, um, the menu bar here and type help link1. So link1 is the element type we're looking for. 
So by typing that, it should automatically open up the help um, system, and says help system, and show us the page um, uh, that um, tells us all the information about the element type. And this, again, this is good practice if you're having trouble with an element and you want to figure out what's going on. So here we go. We've we've uh, gotten a, um, a page up that tells us about link one and tells us what it can be used for. Tells us the input data, the kind of uh, options you have for uh, affecting the behavior of the element and it tells us the kind of output data you can get from um, this element. So you can see that some of the things here uh, you can get um, you can get the uh, axial strain in the element, the axial stress in the element and again this is what we're looking for so we, we'd like to know the axial stress in the element so how do we go about that and um, this, this table here isn't telling us so let's go down a little bit further and we have this item and sequence number thing here. So you can see that it tells us if you're looking for S axel, and what is S axel if you go up to the previous table, it tells us the axial stress in the element, then you need to use a um, sequence number. So in this case you need to use LS1. Okay, so just bearing that in mind and maybe writing that down somewhere, remembering to get the axial stress in the element, it's sequence number LS1. Let's go back to the post processor. Um, so in this case we need to create an element table to access that result. So we move down the uh, menu down to element table down here. So we click on the element table, expand that. We need to define an element table. So we click on define element table. Uh, you can see at the moment there's none defined so we click on add and it tells us what we want to define. Well, if you remember we had LS1 and it was a sequence number, so here if we go down here by sequence number, LS, and we go in here and type 1, and then we have a user label for that. So we can call this whatever we want. I'm going to call it Axial Stress. So again, just to recap, you need to move down in this menu to sequence number, you need to move select LS here and you need to type 1 in there and you need to give it some label and then you type you simply click on OK so you can see that that's defined there again we can close this down now and underneath the next one here we have plot element table so we click on that what do we want to plot well axial stress is the only one we've defined so let's go OK do we want to average that a common nodes let's just say let's not average it for the time being and let's click on OK and now we have values for stress in each of the individual trust members. So you can see here that this um, member here has, has a dark blue value which um, corresponds to a uh, stress uh, of minus 0 0.126 uh, e to the 9. So again if you compare that to um, the results given in the uh, book you will see that that's quite close to the value given. Uh, this one here is a positive value of um, 0.126 uh, e to the 9. Um, again, uh, if we pick any of these, the, the, the yellow ones here are 0.42 e to the 8. And again, if you compare those to the values in the book, they're, they're not that dissimilar. Um, let's just have a, a more um, in-depth look at this and let's list the actual stresses for each, um, each element. And let's go here, list element table. So again, axial stress. And in this case, we're getting a more specific value. Okay, so you can see that while the graphical value told me for for this this particular element, I was getting a value of 0.126 e to the nine. In fact, it, the value is actually 0.123773 e to the nine, which you'll find is exactly the same value that's actually given in the book. Um, and again, this one here um, again is using the same averaging here in the, the actual graphical display of results but in fact it's 0.12597 e to the 9 which you know is a, a minus 125.97 megapascals which is exactly the same value shown in figure 10.04 of the book and you can go down through all the, the, the other elements there and you'll see that you've gotten exactly the same values that, that, that are given in the book. Um, Okay, so um, that's more or less it for um, uh, case study A. So again, if anything hasn't worked out exactly as it is in the book, it is because you, you have made a mistake somewhere and you need to go back and, and try and find out where you've made that mistake. The most common places where people make mistakes is they use the wrong units. So maybe you entered millimeter values in millimeters instead of meters. Maybe you entered kilopascals instead of megapascals or pascals or, and so on. You need to check all that. You need to check your dimensions. You need to check that you've applied the correct loads and the click at, at the correct points with the correct values. 
and you need to check that you've applied the correct constraints. And I'm sure that if you go back over all of these things, you'll find something that went wrong somewhere and you'll be able to correct your model and hopefully arrive at the same uh, answer that we have here and that is given in the book. Okay, so that's it for um, this case study and uh, thanks very much for listening and watching and see you next time.